your vote. Doesn't this become another question of your credibility? AM Agenda on Sky News. Some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Welcome to Your Money, Your Call, and tonight it's Bonds versus Equities. My name's Mark Todd from Fig Securities, and tonight we are targeting investment opportunities in 2013. Will they be in bonds, will they be in equities, or would they be a combination of both? We have an expert panel here to talk to you. We have Mark Barley from Equasia and Ian Wenham from Peak Investments. And we'll be discussing strategies to build the right sort of portfolio for your age group if you're in the 20s, 30s, 50s, 70s, we will work out what sort of portfolio might look best for you. Now don't forget, if you want to be part of the program, you can email us on yourmoney at skynews.com.au sky or you can call us on 1300 30 34 35. Gentlemen, welcome. How's the year? Um, I suppose, start with you, Mark. We, we're in January, we can still look at 2012. How did 2012 play out for you? The bond markets have rallied, so how did Equasia perform and, and what did you think of that market in 2012 for you? Yeah, look, I guess look at the broader market, I mean, I think everyone was surprised at how um, low the rates stayed and, and, and not only globally because I think everyone accepts that rates in, in Europe and also in the States are going to stay low for an extended period of time. Whereas I think in Australia at the start of the year there was a bit of um, kind of conflict in terms of economists' forecasts of how low rates were going to go and I think in the end to finish the year at 3% was, was probably towards the low end of expectations and obviously within that backdrop fixed income and um, bonds in particular, government bonds, performed exceptionally well in that falling rates environment which is what, what you would expect. So you know Equasia within that um, uh, backdrop performed very well. Uh, our credit enhanced credit fund had returns of over 9% for the, for, the, for the year and outperformed our index which was bank bills plus 300 quite considerably. Um, and you know, 2013 I think it's going to be a bit more of the same. As we were talking before the program went on air, it's quite difficult to get assets at the moment and to try and get your uh, hands on fixed income assets because there's not a lot around at the moment and because you've had a significant rally in spreads in the um, last uh, two or three months in particular in Q4, um, it's going to be a difficult year to, to beat that performance. And I suppose Ian, when Mark mentions the economists getting it right and getting it wrong, you, you need to laugh. When you say the economists are going to get it right, everyone just giggles. And then they still, you know, they're well employed and they're better than the guy at Rio. So how was 2012 for you? Well, it was quite a, a funny type of year, really. Um, the Australian market, it felt like it was an extremely tough year. But in actual fact, the returns out of equities were almost stellar. Um, the all ASX 200 accumulation index was up by about 20%. Now, when you mention 20% return, numbers. no one can actually believe that it actually took place. Yeah. Um, we, I suppose, spent all of the year climbing that wall of worry that people talk about. Yep. Um, people were worried about Europe, we were worried about America, we were worried about China. And it wasn't really, I suppose, until perhaps the, the latter part of the year that we started to perhaps feel a little bit better about things. Sort of around where the, where the, you felt that the European situation had calmed. It was not that the Americans don't ever seem to be calm, but it, it felt like once Europe seemed to have got its way through, that Greece stayed part of the German axis and they were all happy again. And once that seemed to happen, it calmed a little bit and then everyone started to get into the assets that they thought provided some sort of return. Mm. And, and that was in both equities and fixed income, wasn't it? Yes. Yeah. I suppose the question is 2013. 2012, uh, it's 20% returns. That was great, but it really hurt. I have an ulcer, you know. <laughs> Next, uh, 2013, how does that shape up now? When you look at the horizon, it's more the same, or is it a different uh, ulcer giving performance? Well, I think from, from an equi equities point of view, we're actually, I think, relatively cautious at this stage, certainly at this level at 4,000, almost 800 uh, at the moment. Um, the way we're looking at the market, we have had what we call a liquidity-driven rally. Uh, there's been absolutely no improvement at all in corporate earnings. The economic outlook, in our view, still looks pretty tough, certainly through the first half. Mm. We've had 1.7 off the cash rate. We've been cutting rates for 15 months, and it is very hard to find any green, green shoots as far as the economy is concerned. Yep. So I think the, the bottom line is that we can 
see share prices continue to move up in the short term if rates get cut by another 50 basis points or so. That will continue to see money flow out of term deposits and fixed income securities and drift back into hybrids and, and, and high yielding paying stocks. Uh, I mean, I think you're right. Isn't it? When, you, when you look at the economy itself, the, the numbers say that it's all very solid, but anecdotally people feel very anxious. And, and Blue Scope loses um, employees. Uh, you have different companies saying in the manufacturing space, we're letting staff go. Mm. And you have write downs in the mining piece that means that other people lose their jobs. You do feel there's a sense that we're about to hit some sort of wall, mm. but at the same time, everyone's buying equities that they think will give them a bond-like performance. So, so do you agree? How do you see that playing out, I mean, I the economy? I think there's a couple of issues. I think, you know, the headlines are always, are always generally negative. Job cuts, as you say, write-downs, and no one really focuses on, on the positives, the, the small hires, because that doesn't really sell newspapers, it sells no. media space. And, you know, we, we had unemployment figures out this week at 5.4%, in line with expectations, slightly uptick from the 5.3 uh, revised in the previous month. Now, does that give um, the RBA, I guess, uh, a, a green light to, to cut rates again? You know, potentially, and then the February meeting is definitely live in terms of whether we get another 25 basis point cut. It's just about 50-50 in the markets. Economists are probably around about a third saying we'll get a cut. But I think if you look at within Australia, within the global picture, it's still very attractive in terms of the, the mm. levels of growth that they're going to get. And also secondary, secondary is the, the government fiscal position is very strong. You know, for me, I don't really mind if it's a small surplus, small deficit. It's, it's neither here nor there. When you look into Europe and into the States and the problems that they've got over there addressing their budget. So that means that Australia and Australian sovereign will maintain that AAA rating and also those interest rate differentials will remain and that will keep the Aussie dollar high and therefore it will be an attractive place for global capital to come into and I think that will help asset prices both in the fixed income market domestically and also in, in equities as well yeah. so it, it, it you know and but equally you know it, it, it is tough out there you know the mining sector is highly dependent on China and the resources and the iron ore price and the coal price and retailers are still suffering probably because of the internet and um, offshore competition and I think they're starting to realize that you're starting to see prices come down permanently so I think that's going to help keep inflation on, in check, we'll get a, yeah. kind of a, another figure next week. Um, but I think, you know, generally speaking, Australia is in a pretty good position globally, despite the fact we're feeling pretty, pretty downbeat mm. about ourselves. Um. Ian, you know, I suppose, you know, we talk about this thing, the black swan, which for the viewers at home, it's the idea that uh, the unexpected might come and attack your portfolio. So, you know, your black swan experience, I, I, I want to be more specific. How do you see the politics playing out? And I don't mean the election that we're about to have this year. I mean, broadly speaking, the European story, the, the North American story, how it affects, and, and the Chinese story, you know, new leadership there, how it affects the investment thesis. Do you, do you need to concentrate on it, or does it become its own black, black swan? They wake up and say, we won't do this debt ceiling. How, how do you look at that? Well, I think it, it, it has certainly been a major contributor to that high level of volatility that we experienced last year. Hmm. Um, a lot of it was to do with political issues, you know, the debt ceilings, the, the, the cliff issues. I mean, all of these things have gone right down to the wire. Yep. And that just causes markets to be very volatile, be very short-term focused. So I think the politics, I mean, at the end of the day, one would have to say that politics in the Western world at the moment, there is just a complete lack of political leadership. Mm. I mean, you take America, you take Europe, you take Australia. I, if, they is, were, if they lacking. were children, you'd it put them lacking. in every corner and say, you can't come out until you can learn how to play. I mean, so you come ridiculous. back to this point, you're talking about confidence, yep. and it's very hard to see confidence materially improving while all, all of this, well, the, no one has any confidence whatsoever. Yeah, in, it, it, in it terms does. Of it affects the confidence leadership. a lot for, for your investment, whether it be a business strategy, whether it be an investment strategy, whether it just be what to do with the, the, the education numbers, how to play, how to live your life when you think, I don't really understand what the political idea is. I don't know who's going to lead the country yeah. and I don't know what part of um, the inability to conduct yourselves as adults mm. will not make sense to these people. Yeah. Look, markets hate uncertainty, yeah. and as as Ian says, as long as you've got uncertainty out there, it's 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 a nightmare for the individual or the corporate. They can't plan long term. The way that I look at the situation in the states and in Europe is is slightly different. I think the states is a bit like herding sheep. They, you, you can herd sheep, it's a bit difficult, but the Republicans and the Democrats will come to some kind of agreement on the debt ceiling and also on the budget. It'll be tough, but eventually you can get the sheep through the gates and into the pen and 
you know, your, your home. Whereas in Europe, it's like herding cats. You know, you know, f f the French want to drink their milk. You know, the, the, the Germans want you know different kind of cat food. You know, the Greeks have you know are just somewhere else, and you just can't herd them. They're all going in different directions, wanting different things. And no matter how hard you try, you can't get them on that path to get home. And uh, you know, that's the situation. I'm so much more worried about Europe, yeah. and I think there's more issues to come up in 2013. And I think 2013 for the states, whilst being bumpy and maybe you shave a, a few percentage points off or basis points off um, GDP growth in the states, you've still got a solid base there, and I think you'll get through it. So does that mean you don't buy European credit? Does that mean that if SOCGEN issues bonds in Australian dollars, you wouldn't buy their bonds? Is it, is it Europe credit in general you'd want to avoid? I, I, don't, I don't think you can look at it on broad terms. You know, there's a, there's a price for everything. Right. I think I'd be definitely more cautious about French banks, uh, as you would do with Sp uh, Spanish banks, because you just don't know what assets are potentially going to get written down down the track in terms of you know the Spanish um, uh, property portfolios on the Spanish banks I don't think have been fully accounted and you know if, if, if Spain asks for a bailout how, how much does that tie in the, the the close neighbors the French and you know Italians and you know it's it's all very closely internet in yeah. terms of if one falls and you know the potential for the next one is is is, is, is pretty real quite challenging um, and tell me about peak what's your business how, how do you get about earning the crust that you need to live the life you want um, peak is a business that specializes in individual, it's a genuine IMA business. We establish uh, portfolios uh, that are designed to meet individuals or family groups specific financial objectives. Uh, you effectively have your own dedicated portfolio manager. We operate in the high net worth space. Um, we, our portfolios generally include a combination of uh, equities and fixed income. We do a little bit of stuff internationally as well. Um, each portfolio has its own particular mandate, which is, is, which is reflective of what the client is trying to achieve. Uh, Peak has been going for 10 years. It is owned by three principals and um, we've had a very loyal client base, so through good times and bad. So how long have you been in the markets? I mean, if, I, if, I, if, if I'm a person with a lot of money, which I'm not, but if I was, um, and I come to Peak, You'll then say, I've been in the market, we've been in existence for 10 years, but I've been in the market, I know you're a young man, but I've been yes. in the market for maybe a lot longer. Yes. Is that, how do you articulate that to the client? Because I, I've got this thing at the moment, the GFC created a lot of carnage around the advisor base, and some of it rightly so, mm. because they were fraudulent in their behaviour, but some of it, be, people, the advisor base didn't see, hadn't ever seen this before. Mm. And so it was very hard to come up with the right strategy for the right client when, in point of fact, how would you know? Because you hadn't seen it before. So how do you articulate, give the, the, the client some comfort around that? How do you do that? Well, all these great hairs, Mark, de de demonstrate <laughs> one of two things, and that very much is to do with, uh, I suppose, having gone through the 87 crash, the, I was in Hong Kong during the, uh, the Asian crisis. So, I mean, all of those things are, are very interesting experiences. No, there's no, no two uh, major market events that are the same. But... In terms of the dealing with, say, the GFC, what was really important there was to uh, be in fairly close touch with your clients, understanding how they were thinking about the, the situation at the time. Uh, we had a number of clients who, this was kind of another event, they'd been in equities for 20 or 30 years, they'd seen this stuff before and were quite happy to, to deal with it in the way that they'd dealt with equities at previous times. They may have taken a bit of money out, for example, or de-risked de their portfolios, but by and large they're happy to stay. Other people who had much less experience with the markets, they were the ones that you needed to be very very cautious with, very careful with, and be very active in terms of taking, being proactive in restructuring their portfolios or even getting them out of the market completely. Right. Um, we found the most difficult clients, and we only had two or three of them, thank goodness, but it was the clients with margin lending accounts that were the ones that, that were seriously struggling with it. The disastrous margin lending. Correct. We must go to a break. Um, what we'll do is we'll come back later with Mark and he can tell us how he wins the clients over. Now remember, if you do want to be part of the show, please call us on 1300 30 34 35, or you can email us on yourmoney at skynews.com.au. is your one-stop back-to-school shop for shoes. With all the shoes you need from the playground to the sports ground. Like podiatrist-approved Deanna and Dean Leather Upper School Shoes for $29 a pair. And with our in-store kids' shoe fitting service, you can trust that the shoe you buy is the shoe that fits. Target, your one-stop back-to-school shop. 
See us in store and online at target.com.au. As the nation turns its attention to the election, join me throughout 2013 for the most comprehensive coverage of issues crucial to the nation. Crying out for this issue. And vital to your vote. Doesn't this become another question of your credibility? AM Agenda on Sky News. January on Nat Geo Wild. With the dawn of a new year comes the promise of new wonders. New challenges and new surprises. This January, follow your instincts to Nat Geo Wild. Greetings fellow viewers, my name's Paul Murray and I host a little thing called Paul Murray Live and I've got something to tell you. We are adding an extra night to Paul Murray Live. Will it be Friday nights? No. I need to sleep. We will be doing Sunday nights as well. So we'll go Monday to Thursday adding a Sunday night program. I really should have just put it this way. Our program will be on five nights a week. The best debate, conversation, no longer will you hinge that you've got to go to work on Monday because you've got something to look forward to. Sit back, you can finish off your weekend with this special election year, one heck of a special show. Join me for the super extended extra edition, Paul Murray Live, Sunday nights, all this year, only on Sky. Holden, proudly sponsoring Paul Murray Live. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. My name is Mark Todd from Fig Securities and tonight I'm joined by Mark Bailey from Equasia and Ian Wenham from Peak Investments and they're here to answer your questions tonight. Um, please call us at 1300 30 34 35 if you have any questions. Uh, before the break we were talking about the, the, the idea that the GFC meant that people had to work differently to win uh, customers over and that, and that the customers were less trusting and understandably so because of the, the burn that had happened with you know, poor advice and, and people not understanding what was happening. In terms of Equasia, how do you go about winning those people over and, and what's the strategy around Equasia's business plan? How do you go about that? Yeah, I'll just give you a bit of background broadly about Equasia. Um, we're a, a small corporate advisory boutique specialising in M&A, um, equities and also debt markets and also we run um, some small credit funds as well, some are specific assets and the largest is um, an Equasia Enhanced Credit Fund which targets wholesale investors. We invest in um, a whole range of uh, fixed income products that could be um, mortgages, uh, loans, um, subordinated debt hybrids, um, so we've been in involved in that space. It's a relatively new business, it's been up and running only three years and on the fund side just over a year. So we, we were kind of post GFC and we saw plenty of opportunities which is why we wanted to get involved in the market. There was a lot of um, assets that weren't priced correctly because people were still scared to own them and didn't really understand them. I think what happened in the GFC, everyone just said as you say, GFC is happening, I don't understand everything, and just threw, threw the baby out with the dish, di ditch water. Um, and um, you know, in terms of um, the opportunities there, there was, there's, there's quite a few. That throughout 2011, 2012 has become less, as, you, as you, you've found as well, uh, because spreads have tightened and going into 2013, it's quite difficult to get those assets on, on the balance sheet to, to work for you. Um, in terms of our experience, we've got very specific credit experience. Uh, my background's from high yield research in Europe, did that for five years, I've been in the markets for 16, um, so still pretty young compared to a lot of guys <laughs> like you and uh, Ian. Um, Gently. <laughs> only, only by a couple of years. but. Um, you know, we, 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 we work on the principle that we understand the, 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 the assets that we're buying in detail, so we'll read through all the perspectives and understand the hybrid perspectives. We've got a, a, an analyst portfolio manager who's very good on, on the RMBS and understanding the prepayments and all the intricacies of the RMBS portfolios out there. Um, and that's what we do. We pick up assets that we think are undervalued and then obviously let them go when um, we, th we see the opportunity. Great. Um, now we have a caller who's called in, David from Sydney. Hi, David. Oh, hi there, team. Listen, you know, I've been reading the Financial Review carefully and I'm, I'm obviously interested in sort of a level of fixed income investment in my portfolio. Currently, I'm running probably 90-10, which has actually served me remarkably well in the last year or so, I have to say. Sure. Uh, in terms of, you know, just keeping enough, using the bucket plan from Ron Woodhull and Ron, Ron you know, from um, Woodhull Investments, you know, of saying, well, OK, I'll keep three or four years pension and then look after myself in, in equities. But, you know, there are a lot of people like Christopher Joy and so on 
who are saying that the getting oneself involved in fixed interest in an area where potentially we're seeing inflationary forces building all over the world um, with you know QE happening sort of pretty much everywhere from you know the US, the UK, Europe, Japan. You know I'm sure Lithuania is doing a bit as well, but I can't promise. Um, I, I just wonder sort of how one is meant to play using a sensible you know, ratio of fixed interest in an environment is do you have to sort of move directly to inflation linked bonds and if so where are the best ways you can obtain those or do we just assume inflation is not going to go beyond four or five percent and uh sit quietly with what we're, what we're planning to buy you know just a just a very broad question on the risk of fixed interest in an environment where inflation could potentially get very serious I mean, clearly, I mean, Mark, you know, the, the idea here is, you, and they're great questions. I mean, the idea here is is that you start with an inflation-linked bond, whether it be a Sydney airport with... And remember, when we talk about inflation-linked bonds, if we say the rate is 4.30 or um, 4% real, what we mean is above the CPI, so it's 4% plus whatever the CPI becomes, 25 you'll average out 65 over the life of these bonds. So, I mean, when David speaks that, the first thing I'm looking at is Sydney Airport, Praco, the defence housing, infrastructure bonds, they're the sort of things that I'd be looking at. But how would you suggest that he tailors a, a portfolio entirely? What he's talking about, higher rates yeah. coming through inflation and the like. Yeah, look, look David, I think that's, that's, those are great questions. And I think in terms of you know where, where you're at, your understanding of fixed income is, is a lot higher than a lot, lot of people in Australia in particular because it doesn't form a huge part of their, their portfolios. But how do you protect it against inflation and higher interest rates? That's obviously a key concern, especially if you've got um, fixed income and obviously higher rates mean lower value in terms of your, uh, your price of bonds. There's several ways you can try and protect that. You can use floating rate notes, which is where obviously where as rates go up to, which is probably what the RBA would do to counteract higher inflation, you'd see your coupon increase as well and that would give you a better benefit and it protects you somewhat in a similar way to the inflation link side of things um, protect you against the uh, the higher um, higher rates and higher inflation so for david a, a floating rate note might be a, a national australia bank you know note so so banks go to issue you know bonds floating rate notes to fund their performance so they yeah, can fund it, their it, it loans. So you go and buy that sort of it bond. could be a bank or it, it could be a corporate corporates can either or banks can issue either in uh, in fixed rates, so it's maybe 6% fixed for five years, yeah. or maybe that's 300 basis points over BBSW, and that BBSW is pretty closely tied to um, the cash rate, and that will vary along with the RBA and, and expectations on interest rates. And I suppose, Ian, when you're looking at building those sorts of portfolios, you assume a, a level of uh, knowledge and then you make a greater assumption is that you can't predict rates. You don't know where rates are going to go, you don't know what inflation will do. You, you assume inflation will hit, you, you just don't know the timing. So what theoretically you should do is allow for all of it. You have a bit of fixed, you have a bit of floating and you have a bit of the, the inflation linked bonds. And that mix sits around where your age is yeah. and, and I think that can lead to our next point within, about where are you, how old are, yeah. how old are you in the scheme of that, things. That's, that's within a, a fixed income portion of yeah. your portfolio. I don't think you should all, all be in fixed income unless no. you're getting really, mm. really old. A balance between and yeah, e equities is obviously a, a good place to be if, if you're younger and you know, trying to in the accumulation stage and looking for growth. Well, okay, speaking about that, and, and, and I don't disagree at all, um, the, if you're in the early stages, let's say I'm in my 20s, which I wish I was, but I'm not, if you're in your 20s and you wanted to start a portfolio, you've, you've got your first job, you're starting to put some money aside, how do you start thinking about what that portfolio looks like? Where, where is that balance? Is it um, only equities? Is it, you know, what do you do and how do you come about it? Damn. Well, it depends a lot on the individual as to whether they're comfortable owning equities and have owned equities in their past or whatever. But um, generally, the because the, at 20 you've got time on your side, and therefore the focus should be on growth, growth assets, whether it's property, whether it's equities, as your your primary base of the portfolio. Yeah. Um, and within a, an equities portfolio, um, I just make the point that. There are equity portfolios and there are equity portfolios. Um, you can have a very defensively structured portfolio. I mean, for example, last year the industrial market um, generated a re total return of 28%. Resources generated a return of 1%. So within 
the ASX 200, there is a wide dispersion of, of risk and return opportunities. Right, so, so to that point, for the viewers at home, an industrial, give me two industrials that you're talking about. I'm talking about a West Farmers or a Telstra. I mean, yeah. last year Telstra had a return of more than 40%. Yeah, phenomenal. Yeah. Absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. Um, what about you, Mark? If a person comes to you and he's in his 20s, he's you know, had a windfall, he's got some money, what are you suggesting in terms of the, the fixed income side of that portfolio? What would he be looking for? Look, I guess, I guess pointing to Ian's point, you know, it's important to understand their risk appetite, even even at 20, and that goes all the way through the age groups. Um, some people are risk averse, some are, some people are risk risk takers. Within the younger generation, it's a smaller portion, and as a general rule of thumb, people sometimes work on your age should be your portion in, in fixed income yep. investments. So at 20, maybe you've got 20% in fixed income, and you're kind of understanding what that uh, fixed income investment does, how it works, and it's quite difficult to get access to that as a young person on an individual basis. Yes, you have your retail hi um, hybrid space where the bonds are traded on the ASX, but that's kind of a quite limited range of bonds and you, c you can't get inflation linked. Well, you can certainly come to FIG and buy bonds from well, us, so don't, feel free to the, do that. Yeah. Suggest that, Mark, no problem. <laughs> you can, they cannot, I mean, obviously, you know, FIG's got a, a great um, system where you can buy retail bonds in smaller clips than from the, on the wholesale side of things, right. uh, and that's that's obviously an opportunity. But I'll just butt in here for one sure. second because we've got a caller, um, Peter from New South Wales. Hello, Peter, how are you? Oh, hi guys, how you doing? Good, okay, thanks. Lovely. Listen guys, um, I'm in my mid-20s uh, and I wanted to start a portfolio, uh, shares, bonds. Uh, I've got $30,000, but the thing is, uh, well, the reason I'm calling in today is, is because uh, I wanted to know what percentage I should allocate uh, to bonds versus shares. Uh, and also, uh, I'm not very good with maths, uh, what is that percentage-wise for $30,000? We'll start with you, Ian. What's um, your have you had any previous experience with equities? No, this is, uh, I'm, I'm quite fresh. And do you see yourself as being a risk taker or where do you sit on the, on the risk spectrum? Uh, I sit on the fence for a lot of things, uh, Ian, um, but probably, uh, probably not too risky. Yeah. So you wouldn't like to lose, well, I suppose perhaps one way of looking at it is how much are you prepared to lose? How much would, would worry you? Uh, if you're referring to a stop loss, I guess I'd probably only want to go down uh, a few thousand, uh, maybe three thousand or so. Yeah. Whether that's realistic or not, I'm not sure. Yeah, well, it sounds to me like you'd probably do on a combination of both, and um, um, and within the equities component, I would suggest that it's structured relatively cautiously as well, just to get you into the, you know, the feel of actually owning an equity portfolio, which will go up and down in value. So some equities and maybe some hybrids. Yeah, I think so. Kind of maybe there's the higher quality hybrids, the better quality names. We can um, talk about some of the quality of those hybrids soon because some of those hybrids are just have no quality. You know what I mean, <laughs> the, 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 there's there's a, there's a full range. You know, the the, the hybrid, as as the name indicates, the hybrid is part debt, part yep. equity, and there's a full spectrum of yep. those on the market. Yep, and you know, maybe in Peter's case, you know, he's just starting out, probably sticking the higher quality names. There's also the opportunity down the line, and hopefully this is going to happen fairly shortly, that um, on the ASX you're going to have the ability to get involved in um, government bonds as well, and maybe that's a, uh, an opportunity that you should stick to and maybe play that uh, shorter end of that market. So let's move the spectrum up from, from a person who's in their 20s to a person who's a approaching retirement age. One of my great concerns is that when you've worked so hard as you have to get to that retirement um, age and you've got that money to invest in, you're asking people who've spent their time being you know, engineers to now become investment analysts. So, so what would the best way to go about building a portfolio for a person that is just about to be in retirement phase and looking to, to, to take the best sort of returns? How would, how would you structure it for, for that sort of customer? And what would you do? Well, I think once you start getting towards retirement age, then time is not on your side. So in many respects, that's when you start to de-risk your portfolio. So that from a capital preservation point of view, that becomes a much greater objective, priority, as opposed to maintaining, as, as opposed to aiming at growth. So we would certainly suggest for somebody approaching their retirement age that for a start that you structure the equity portfolio or the, the equity component of your portfolio to be far less risky than what it has been, probably more income oriented. There's that capital stability that people are now very scared of, of another GFC event. 
Mm. And if you're in your, you know, if you're in your 60s, and suddenly your you portfolio is down by 30 percent, you don't have time to make that back up again. That's right. So, you know, you do need to have firstly a much slower risk equity component, and you'd also increase the fixed income component. We'll come back to you, Mark, and, uh, after the break and see what you would do with a 65-year-old man. <laughs> um, we must leave it now. We'll go for a short break. Uh, we will be right back. Now, if you'd like to be part of the panel, please call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email us at yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Nissan's 2012 final clearance. And for two weeks only, you'll get these great 2012 models at Nissan's lowest prices ever. Because we're taking $2,012 off 2012 plate vehicles. But don't wait. Stocks are limited. The player is never in a position where he doesn't believe he can win. The question is, how is he going to win? Be ready at all times. Just stand. I always look for improvements, whether it's with the kids or with professional players. In sports, you only get what you put into it, especially individual sports, and many times you get less out of it than you put into it. If you do something, don't you want to do it well? And the only way to do it well is to keep getting better, because the moment you stop getting better, you're getting worse. You're going to pass him every time. You need to be aware of your power. Anytime you get a high volley, punch it. Where can we improve one, two, three percent? It feels great if you can be part of the team where your player is winning. If you have prepared well, you don't need to be nervous. Greetings fellow viewers, my name's Paul Murray and I host a little thing called Paul Murray Live. And I've got something to tell you. We are adding an extra night to Paul Murray Live. Will it be Friday nights? No. I need to sleep. We will be doing Sunday nights as well. So we'll go Monday to Thursday adding a Sunday night program. I really should have just put it this way. Our program will be on five nights a week. The best debate, conversation, no longer will you hinge that you've got to go to work on Monday because you've got something to look forward to. Sit back, you can finish off your weekend with this special election year, one heck of a special show. Join me for the super extended extra edition. Paul Murray Live, Sunday nights, all this year, only on Skype. Holden, proudly sponsoring Paul Murray Live. Paul, my name's Mark Todd of Fig Securities and I have Mark Bailey from Equasia and Ian Wenham from Peak Investments. Before the break we were talking about a um, 65 year old person comes in and, and says I need to get a portfolio. What would you suggest to that client as, as the sort of portfolio and how would he go about it? Yeah, I mean, hopefully he's, he's, he's already got a portfolio and it's just kind of a case of allocating those assets within that portfolio in an efficient manner. As you get towards retirement, 65, you should be thinking about moving more into the fixed income sector, um, you know, corporate credit, government bonds, maybe some cash in there as well because you want to de-risk your portfolio because you know you, you, you can't really survive a 30% plunge in equities, which is possible, and you can get you know hit pretty severely in the fixed income space, but it, it shouldn't be as severe as, as is possible in equity. So therefore, you're kind of preserving your capital because you don't have that time to rebuild that if things go wrong. So I think, you know, if you're 65, you know, looking at maybe 70%, 75% in, in, in fixed income and trying to generate income that way whilst keeping preserving his capital. Well, give me an example of a fixed income. You know, what, give me a name that somebody might know. Is it, you know, is it a Telstra bond? Is that the sort of thing that we're looking at? Because, you know, there's some really high running yields in those things. Telstra gives a great coupon. Um, it, the, it's the 2020 bond. Y you, you make a lot of money in terms of uh, living money. You know, you, you get the, the, the coffee money, you get the, the golf fees. It, it's a nice bond to have and people are very comfortable with the type of bond it is, the type of company it is. Yeah. I mean, you, you know, you can sleep safe at night with, 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 with Telstra hopefully in your portfolio. I guess the problem is, is getting access and, and FIG does allow you to get access to these, these wholesale bonds. But a lot, the bulk of people, the, the normal retail investor, can't get access to Telstra mm -hmm. bonds because they're not listed on the ASX. And you know, it's just the hybrids and you know the banks and the Caltex is the crowns, and you know the the Myobs, those types of bonds that have listed on the ASX that that retail investors can easily get access to. Otherwise, you've got to look at a fund manager who who has the the access to the wholesale market and can invest in a diversified portfolio. Well, and what what do you think of the hybrid space? I mean, let's let's just move to that one because Mark and I have been talking about the hybrids. How do you find it? What do you think of them? Well, 
We, we, I mean, they're obviously very helpful for, for an equity investor at a point in time such as this where term deposit rates continue to fall, at least the hybrid space is giving our clients an opportunity to, to participate in fixed income securities and receive 3 4% more than the cash rate. So from that point of view, they're, they're serving a purpose. Um, but here, with is respect this, to here is the sting in the tail, isn't it? There is well, a there sting is, in the tail. Exactly. And that's, there's a big issue around the structure of the hybrids um, in that they are very complex. There's not two the same. Some of the traditional fixed income products that we've been able to invest in, such as convertible notes, which we would, or convertible bonds, convertible shares, where there's a fixed term and in five years you get your money back or you get a stock. At least you, you know where the end point is. With the hybrids, you're essentially dealing with 200 pages of fine print. You're dealing with, at the end of the day, a lot of these are, the, the, the term is based on how the rating agencies are going to judge these things. Mm. And I'd have to say that, you know, as an advisor, I have no faith at all in, you know, being in the hands of the rating agencies. Yeah, they performed so well through 07, 08, 09, and then yes. they, they recalibrated themselves. And as I'm going to trust new. them yeah. to do the right thing in five years' time. That's right. Do, well, do well, you know what? I'm actually going to stick out for the rating agencies. Really? <laughs> that, know, that'll get the and, viewers excited. And, and you know, in, in, to their credit, they, they didn't get the, the structured side correct at all. You know, the whole structured credit, the subprime, their financial models, the CDOs didn't work well. But in, in, the, in the corporate land, they've actually, they've actually done a pretty good job in the last four or five years in the, rating the corporates. There hasn't been the masses of, masses of downgrades. And yet, sure, they've, they've always missed the, the frauds and the Enrons, yeah. the, the WorldComs of the world, which, which even, even the auditors, which had an even more detailed look, missed as well. So in, in, in the pure corporate space, they've actually done a pretty good job. And you, know, we, you can slate them for as much as you want. Unfortunately, they are still such an integral part of, of the business and portfolio managers in the fixed income world for better or for worse, still rely heavily on those ratings. And maybe they've portfolios. lifted their standards, so that maybe it's, it then becomes warranted. But they do have um, a history that, that should judge them probably a little bit harsher than it is. Uh, at, but I, but I, I take your point. But yeah, they, they Corporates are, might have been easier to, to get, but the thing that really hurt everyone was around the mortgages, where correct. they got that completely yeah. wrong. Uh, so it's yeah. okay to get the corporate right, but when you get the mortgages so lo wrong, the effect has been so dramatic. It, look, it, it hurts the, the overall opinion and credibility of the rating agencies with, without a doubt. Mm. But if you look at the, the specifics of the, of the corporate ratings, they've actually done a, a, a reasonable job through the, this, this GFC. So let's go back to the, the hybrid story. We, uh, we'll talk about Crown. You know, before we came on, on the show, what, what's the maturity of Crown? When does it mature? I did, well, it, when it was issued, it was a 65-year 60, bond, so I think that's 2072. It's a final legal maturity. Right. And, and with some of the things with Crown, I looked at the, some of the documentation, and we, we spoke about this before, in that it is very complex. Mm. And then they put some things in there, and I understand that the lawyers want to protect the issuer. I, I get all that, but some of the stuff they put in there around the dividend payment versus the bond payment, in that if they didn't want to pay, and I don't think they would do this, but if, if they didn't want to pay the coupon on the bond, they didn't have to, and they could still pay dividends. Now, I'm not saying they'd ever do that, but why would you write it in? Mm. It, it just it makes you feel a little bit more uncomfortable about, if you're looking to protect the customer, I get it, but what you've done is not honoured the issue of what the, these hybrids are supposed to be. They're supposed to give people a fixed income feel. Yeah. That, that's the well, idea it's just of it. Yeah. in favour of the issuer and not the, not the holder. Yeah. And, and, and that's a danger for the retail investors that are investing in, in these hybrid products. It, they are incredibly complex and even somebody, in my experience, struggles to understand them. As, yep. a, as a fixed income professional that's been doing this for 16 years and should be fairly comfortable with prospectuses, you still, still takes you a long time to go through. We must go to a call. We have Richard calling. Hello Richard, how are you? It's really like to take the panel to task over the uh, volatility of sh uh, shares versus the um, income that they've derived. I've looked uh, back at my statements from 2007 till now, and I'm sure the shares have been volatile. I've got CBA, Origin, Woolworths, I mean Coca-Cola, the ASX, BHB, etc. And I mean, all I've seen is a steady increase in my dividends over the uh, last six years. I have been in the market now for around 29 years. I'm nearing retirement, and I'll be taking my retirement to de-risk the portfolio even more because I'll have more time to analyse uh, my stocks. Thanks panel, bye.
I don't think Richard's got a question. I think he's just got a statement. So he's done well out of dividends, and there's been dividend growth, and that yeah. and that means, and and he's right because the GFC. One of the things they did was that the corporations had to provide dividends to get the funding. They had to say. Uh, we need money, we'll provide you with the dividend. That, that seems to be with a lower cash rate. That yeah. was an attractive I think it was alluding to, to the volatility as well in shares. Yes. And, and as you go through retirement, part of the, the move to fixed income will reduce your volatility of your Absolutely. portfolio. I mean, the volatility. Stephen Nash from Fig, he does a great story. What was it this week? It was don't buy a lemon. Yeah. I mean, the idea that you could have volatility in your portfolio and, and manage volatility through fixed income was a great story because it makes a lot of sense. Mm. You don't want to, even though the rest of the world is driven by Asia, by the China by the India growth when you wake up in the morning and you look at the Dow it it's, shouldn't really affect your portfolio but that volatility that was driven by the Dow um, certainly affects your retirement mm. you know it, it, it becomes too stressful and you should try and de-stress and that's mm. what volatility does it gives you a lot of stress mm. speaking of the retirement um, longevity do you see that as a great concern at the moment is that something we're living longer people have got an expectation on the quality of life and they've got a certain amount of money that they think they'll live on and we know governments at large are trying to say we don't want to pay a pension we want to manage our affairs so that you look after yours mm -hmm. um, and how do you manage this longevity issue what, what do you say to your customers yeah, it's a really good question um, I'd have to say that from from our experience within our business uh, and bearing in mind that we probably have clients who you know, certainly historically have had equities in their portfolio so then they naturally will have perhaps more of a growth bias even even in retirement um, but our experience has been that most of our clients uh, and probably half of the peak business is actually DIY super funds yeah. um, and probably 25 percent of them would be in pension mode um, but what we're seeing is people are just taking out the minimum there's no sign of people taking out the maximum if they're taking out the minimum if you take out four percent per annum uh, with a portfolio that's even a, a mix of low risk equities and, and fixed income, you're at least going to cover that. Yep. So the capital base is not really declining much. In fact, even some that are, are in pension mode are actually increasing in value. So at this start, and this is bearing in mind we've been through five pretty tough years, or five very mm. volatile years, as the caller just pointed out. Yeah. But um, What about you, Mark? What's the longevity yeah, the young man that you've just reminded us? <laughs> Well, I'd maybe turn it on its head and, and offer you what the UK does in terms of when you retire in the UK. You have to use 75% of your superannuation pot to, to buy an annuity. And that annuity isn't just covering you for five years, it's covering you until you die. Hmm. And that annuity can be linked to inflation or it can be just a fixed rate, and, and, but it pays out every month until you, until you die. So that's how the UK government is addressing the annuity problem and so what that means is if you're a, a life fund offering annuities you need to buy longer dated assets which is typically fixed income and the longer dated assets generally in, in terms of sector wise is infrastructure and you think back to Australia well do we need infrastructure assets and funding mm. absolutely mm. so a way that the government could help to generate um, kind of um, assets uh, or, or funds to buy assets in that infrastructure space is to maybe have some kind of annuity um, system where you have to use your pension fund to buy an annuity, maybe a small portion to start with, but maybe potentially that's something that could happen in Australia and it would help solve the, the infrastructure funding crisis and help kind of you know, square the circle. I mean, if yeah. we think that the annuity business will continue to grow at, at a great clip, it, it is a, uh, a really interesting business. We, we sell a lot of annuity um, bonds and, and what we like about it is the fact that that payment structure means at the end of it, you don't have that obligation for somebody to give you the $100 back. You've actually spent your money and you can use it for a lifestyle choice. You can see the cash flows. That becomes quite attractive. So, so what's your thoughts on the annuity piece? I, well, not so much on annuities, but I certainly think that the, the infrastructure bonds make an awful lot of sense. Um, it's interesting that the institutional market has been far more successful at accessing investment in infrastructure. I mean, for super funds, they're long life assets that they require for long life income streams. They're perfect. And yet, for, from a retail point of view, it's extremely difficult to play them. Can't find it. Yeah. yeah. Look, we must go to a break. Thank you for watching. Um, please feel free to call. We're at uh, 1300 30 34 35, or you can email us at yourmoney at skynews.com.au.
TPG presents our unlimited bundle. Get unlimited ADSL2 Plus with home phone line rental. Unlimited calls to local and standard national numbers. Unlimited calls to Australian mobile numbers. And unlimited calls to selected international countries. Plus a Wi-Fi modem. All for just $79.99 a month. Yep, $79.99 a month. TPG is a multi-award winner. TPG.com.au Count the number of batteries you rely on every day. Now multiply it by 7.6 million households. As the demand for battery power increases, plan for a positive future today with your own Battery World franchise. Target is your one-stop back-to-school shop for shoes. With all the shoes you need from the playground to the sports ground, like podiatrist-approved Deanna and Dean leather upper school shoes for $29 a pair. And with our in-store kids' shoe fitting service, you can trust that the shoe you buy is the shoe that fits. Target, your one-stop back-to-school shop. See us in-store and online at target.com.au. The main event is on now with complimentary on-road costs, dealer delivery, stamp duty, registration and CTP insurance all included on selected new and demonstrator Land Rover and Range Rover models. The main event, on now. In election year 2013, Sky News stands unrivaled as Australia's election channel. This campaign is now on. And we're ready for the fight. For breaking election news, every view and every angle. An unrivaled team, an unrivaled agenda. Sky News. Sky News. Here and David Spears. It's a ripper. Election year 2013. Bring it on. This is Sky News, Australia's news channels. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Mark Todd from FIG, and my guests are Mark Bailey from Equasia, Ian Wenham from Peak Investments, and they're here to answer your questions tonight. So if you have any questions, please pick up the phone and call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email us. The email is yourmoney at skynews.com.au. Um, inflation. Uh, you know, I believe that we had a call ringing through and it was the question was around about inflation I believe it's not a, a question of uh, if it's just when it's it's a matter of you see the performance of the sovereigns ultimately something will have to happen around that those inflationary rates we had the the carbon tax come through and we had a, a, a little bump in inflation and we think it'll go a little bit lower now but clearly there should be some global inflation coming through the system so how do you as an equity investor how do you present a case to protect against inflation. What do you do there? Well, I think it is a very important issue and certainly as part of the way we go about structuring our portfolios, we, we try and build in a component which is certainly going to benefit uh, or is, is defensive against a rising inflation environment. I mean, I suppose equities to some extent uh, give you a little bit of a hedge anyway. Um, but um, the things we think about with respect to inflation are tending to buy companies where there is a direct link between their revenue stream and the inflation rate. Now if you think about, I'll just use a simple example, Transurban. Every quarter our tolls go up because they're linked to the CPI. So, you know, Transurban is a good example of a company where if inflation does increase, so does its revenues. You know, other examples are Sydney Airport and a number of other infrastructure companies do exactly the yeah. same thing. So, so that's one example. And we've got a caller, Ryan. Hello Ryan, how are you? Uh, hi. Uh, I've got a question in relation to NABHA, if I could ask that. Certainly. Uh, I heard recently on a uh, Your Money, Your Call show, it wasn't this show, it was one of the shares shows, uh, the view was expressed that when the new bail uh, regulations come into force, uh, this will not be as an attractive thing for the NAB as it is now. Uh, and uh, in likelihood, they will then have to redeem these, which theoretically would mean at $100, they're around about 72 for six at the moment. What do you think of that prospect? Um, Mark, I'll, I'll, I've got a view on that, but I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the specifics, um, Ryan, I, I guess I don't, I don't have a strong view and I'm, I'm, I'm not sure the probability that they will buy them back 
following the, uh, the, the changes in regulation with BOL3. I mean, that is an important impact on banks generally, the banking sector in terms of you know, the liquidity ratios that they have to hold and also the, the capital that they have to hold against that and which components they can, they can use. Um, in terms of the, the actual individual specific, I'm not, I'm not sure, so maybe hand back to you. I Mark. think, uh, Ryan, the thing that would stand out to me was at the, end of, uh, at the end of last year, the banks took the opportunity to issue a lot of paper when they could on the old structure. And the view of the banks would be the, the regime, the regulatory regime that existed in, in 2012 applied to that issuance. So if NAB HA was in that issuance, that regulatory regime, Baal the bar three changes won't make a change to that environment. It won't change the aspects of that paper. And the other thing to remember is that uh, people like Mark and the like, the investment professionals, if they see something at $75 and they think this is going to go to $100 and pay out because of a change in the regulatory environment, they would be well into that already and that would be at around about $90 and they'd be moving quickly. If you remember when the, uh, the Greeks were talking about changing some of their investments and the Greek government was looking to buy back its own debt as a way of cutting down debt, the hedge funds all went and bought the debt and made them pay up more for it. So it's, it's clear that the bank's interpretation of how Baal III is that what, what they issued prior will, will it still apply and the new issuance will not allow the step ups and it will have a different environment and there will be different structures. I mean, maybe, maybe as, a, as a slightly different example, we can use Bank of Queensland, which had the BOQPCs out there, yep. and um, there was there was conjecture as to whether that would be called or you know what was going to be ha going to happen there. In the in the eventuality, they didn't actually call it and redeem those bonds, which were trading kind of in the high eights yeah. prior. Mm -hmm. But and it got a lot of bad press and say, look, they've been treated hybrid holders quite poorly. But in actual fact, I don't think that's actually happened. You know, they, they, they've, they've allowed you to roll into a new hybrid, mm. which was actually issued pretty close to market value. Yep. And it's, it's trading, I think, around about 102, maybe just yep. below that at the moment. So you can sell it. So you, and you can sell it, un unless you're a big institutional holder, then maybe it's, it's yeah. slightly different. But for the retail investor, it was, it's actually a pretty good yeah. uh, And And just deal. for the viewers at home, because you know, we're, new, we're bringing the, the fixed income to the, the market and to the investors at home. When you talk about something being called, can you help explain what that might be. Yeah, so um, usually the, the banks and some of the, the, the hybrids have a specific call date when it's expected that these bonds will be bought back. Typically they're bought back at par, which is 100 cents in the dollar, so they're bought back at 100. A lot of the times there's not an obligation to buy those bonds back at par at that call date and you know as we talked about the crown date uh, crown uh, hybrid the actual legal maturity is way way out in 2072 and these bonds could could stay out until that potentially pay the coupon or not depending on the the, the situation of of crown but all the bonds have a specific call date, or most of them will do, where the, the issuer has the option but not the obligation to buy them back. Either maybe it looks like they will do because of the rating implications or because of you know something happens in terms of um, the company itself. Right. So um, the thing that captures everyone's comp uh, uh, the, the, the issue that drives a lot of people is the cash rate, whether it be in the form of the mortgage, whether it be in the form of I'm a retiree, I'm looking at term deposits, they're getting lower. Um, we spoke about the economists getting it wrong. They basically got it wrong through the course of the year. It's now at 3%. What do you think this time next year, what do you, where do you see the cash rate then, Ian? Well, I think we could quite easily see it back at 2.5. I, I, I just don't feel like there's any real momentum in the non-mining part of the economy. We were talking earlier about Australia's doing relatively well. Well, it is doing relatively well. But if you strip out the mining investment component of growth, the rest of it's basically as flat as a tack. Yeah. And despite having had rate cuts, there's no real sign of life there. So yeah. I don't think the Reserve Bank's got any real choice other than to at least go at least one or two more times. What about you, Mark? What's your thought on I, cash? I, I'm pretty much with Ian. I mean, I think the consensus at the moment is that we'll, we'll hit the low of 2.75, so just a 25 basis point cut from now. And I think we could see, you know, maybe 2.25% sometime during this year because yeah. several factors, I think the high Aussie dollar, and I think, as Ian said, it kind of away from the resource sector, the rest of the economy is still doing it pretty tough. I think we'll see a bit of an uptick in unemployment. Mm -hmm. um, that's going to be offset globally by, I think, a fairly steady backdrop 
buy Europe, which is a, a basket case, and I think will continue to be a basket case in 2013. Yep. But the the uh, inflation, I think, will be well under control, so that will allow the RBA to cut rates further to try and stimulate the rest of the economy and uh, keep unemployment so, at a reasonable level. So the, the RBA talks about other people taking up the slack of the mining, so it's other industries taking up the slack. and. The other industries, whatever they may be, whether it be manufacturing, tourism, whatever housing. it might be, yeah. housing, yeah. Um, they all point to the Aussie being where it is. Do you see a situation where the RBA will say, global rates are low, they will be low for a long time, I'm looking at 2% just to try and move that currency down? Because when we hear people talk about the currency wars, and we're part of it, um, we're a very small soldier in this army and we are copying an awful pounding. Mm. Uh, what do you think of the idea that the RBA will move cash rates much lower to try and get that currency down? I mean, my, my or, or do you see them actually trying to sell the currency? No, I, 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 don't, I don't think the RBA will physically go in there and sell the currency. I think kind of any kind of central bank intervention through history has generally failed and failed badly. Yeah. Uh, I think the RBA may potentially jawbone and try and talk down the the, um, the Aussie, and we'll do that through obviously through interest rates will be one part of that policy. But I don't think I'd be very surprised if the RBA does actually go in and start to physically start to sell the Aussie to, Aussie to try and control the levels. I mean, I remember when Soros did it, and the, the Bank of England yeah. said, you know, we will hold this, and uh, they didn't hold that line. It was uh, the Maginot line wrong, and it was. Uh, it really cost them an awful lot of money yeah. and, and push them out. What, what about you, Ian? What's well, your the, thoughts the on the currency? Is that the, the currency is, it's really, it's, it, it, all of this goes back to the fact that there is free money available at the moment. And while ever that free money is available, in my view, you're going to have uh, people searching for yield. And Australia, yeah. whichever way you look at our interest rate structure yeah. and our yield on equities, they're, they're materially higher here than they are anywhere else in the world. Well, so the Aussie is bound to be remaining more bid. So I don't think, I don't even think interest, well, interest, rates cut, interest rate cuts so far have had no impact at all. Without wanting to put the, the viewers to sleep, when we talk about Bail 3, and that's this new regulatory environment to make sure that banks are much safer in safer animals, so that they don't just, you know, be destructive to the rest of the economy. And it's all about the lending so they don't create bubbles and don't lend at the wrong, the wrong margins. Um, the effect of Bail 3, in your mind, what does it do to credit in terms of their ability to lend money? Uh, we are going to have a wrap. I beg your pardon. So we've been told to wrap it up. So thank you for all your great calls. And there wasn't any emails, but the calls are great. Um, it's been a great show tonight. All the best. Thank you for our guests. We've got Mark and Ian from Equation from Peak. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much. We'll see you next week.